the following amount has been paid for by the WZWA Network. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Insider's Edge podcast here on the WZWA Network in conjunction with Blue Wire Hustle. I'm your host with the most on the West Coast, California injury. What a joy, what an honor, what a privilege to be here today and here today with my guest at this time. You know, we've been doing real well in the last few months, uh, getting a lot of uh, legends of deathmatch wrestling on the show. And here we go. Another one right here, right now, ladies and gentlemen, the one, the only honey badger, Neil Diamond Cutter. How are you going, bro? Oh, no, you're one of them. One of those people that consider me a legend. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm doing pretty good, man. Just waking up, uh, trying to get an early start in the day. So. Doing pretty good. How about yourself down under? Yeah, not too bad, bro. It's, uh, you know, it's uh, things are pretty normal over here at the moment. So uh, I've had a, a pretty long weekend. But, um, you know, I'm, I'm happy to be joining you here on this Sunday evening for myself, Sunday morning for you. Um, always the first question on the show, bro. Uh, how did you become a wrestling fan before you got into the business? Uh, around seven or eight. I can't remember, uh, according to the actual timeline, because I've looked up the match. Um, apparently, I was like 10 or 11. I remember being like nine. But uh, I remember watching uh, Glacier come out during his debut on uh, Monday Night Raw. And I was like, wow, that dude looks like Sub-Zero. That's pretty cool. And he did all the ninja <laughs> shit and backflips and stuff. And the DDP came out. And I, I think they worked each other on that match. I'm not sure. But uh, I saw a match with DDP shortly after, and I was like, oh, who's this cool cat, you know, all that jazz, not realizing he's like 100 years old. Uh, (laughs) And uh, then I stumbled across uh, the cruiserweights of WCW, and uh, right there I fell in love with Chris Jericho. Like, he is the goat to me. If I ever get to meet him, I'll scream like a little girl. Um, (laughs) You know, and he inspired me to to pursue wrestling because I always looked at him as, as the underdog, even though he was a dickwad to everybody, uh, he was still that feisty little dude that would not give up. And I was like, I could be that guy. I, I can be like that. And that's how I kind of got into wrestling and then I broke in through backyarding and all that crap. And, you know, the rest is kind of history, you could say. But uh, definitely Glacier was the first dude I ever saw. DDP was the second and Jericho was the third. And Jericho was the one that was like, you can do this. Right. So. Awesome. Yeah, no, I, I noticed that we're, we're quite similar in age, you and I, so I think we kind of grew up around the same era of uh, of wrestling. Um, I, I first became a fan in about 1998. Um, so uh, I, I like talking to people that are around my age that have been in the wrestling business because, uh, you know, the, the those early days uh, as a fan are kind of similar, but – I think a difference between you and I, I didn't even know that there was like hardcore wrestling back then. Uh, it took until like the early 2000s for me to kind of learn about it. But when did you, when were you first aware of like hardcore or deathmatch style wrestling and how did that get into your life? Well, uh, once I started watching WCW, I quickly found out that there was a uh, WWF, you know, at the time WWF. Um and I got onto that, and you know as well as I do, that was during the Austin Attitude Era as it was beginning. So uh, it wasn't very hard for me to kind of run into the hardcore stuff because you had Mick Foley and, and The Rock doing some pretty brutal stuff, and uh, Triple H and The Rock had a real good feud leading up to, to WrestleMania 13. Or was it 13? Or was it 14 they feuded? I think um, it was 14, too. I yeah, that 14, might be it. They had that fall. You remember the pay-per-view fully loaded? Yes. They had a two out of three falls. Yeah, and then that SummerSlam, they had a uh, a ladder match. They're basically redoing the Shawn Michaels, Razor Ramon angle. Right, this like was that. the uh, intercontinental title feud, right? Yep, yep, the workhorse title. Yep. 
yeah and, yeah uh, you know so so i was exposed to violence like pretty early uh <laughs> or at least to the hardcore stuff and then uh i was traipating or traipating ah, i can't even say it right Trape Trape trading tapes what's it there you go yes <laughs> um, and a buddy of mine gave me Born to be Wired and I watched oh, Taboo and Terry Funk just beat the hell out of each other and I was like I want to be that guy <laughs> pointed at Sabu <laughs> it's like that's the dude I want to be fucking <laughs> lunatic crazy fucking no fucks to give it all so that, <laughs> that's kind of how I got into the hardcore stuff uh, Death I really didn't get into until uh, about 2009 2010 when I got into IWA Mid-South and Ian Ryan asked me if I'd be game for it because he saw that I was game for, like, chairs and tables and shit. So <laughs> I was like, all right, well, what do you want me to watch first? And he was watched uh, 2008 King of Death and then watched 2009 back-to-back. And uh, that's when I discovered Danny Havoc and Drake Younger and all those kind of guys, you know, the hybrids at the time. And uh, it just was baffled, like, Danny's creativity and how he built things in the ring and went about his matches and stuff like really, really connected me to Danny Havoc. And then I watched Masada uh, during 2009 and I was just like, oh, that dude's a fucking monster. That'd be awesome to work in, in like some type of match. And then uh, the that King of Death was uh, 2010 and they brought in Masada or no, 2011, the very next year. They brought in Masada, so I was like, oh, cool. I get to watch Masada live. That's going to be real good. Watched him and BJ Whitmer put on a fucking wrestling camp for like 15, 20 minutes. And I was like, I want to be that guy. And <laughs> that Masada. I was like, that's the dude I want to be. The dude can do do it all. He's like Drake Younger. He can do it all. Fucking wrestles. Fucking can go toe-to-toe with Chain. Can beat the fuck out of you if you want to. And, uh, and actually hearing through uh, your podcast, I didn't even know fucking Masada was like any part of like martial arts at all. I've always assumed like, nah, he wants to be my ass. He's going to beat everyone's ass. But now I know he has even more confidence with it because he knows how to break bones and shit too. So I'm like, oh God, don't piss him off. <laughs> awesome, bro. I love hearing how people kind of discover um, this style of wrestling. And um, I wanted to go back up. You had mentioned you'd done some backyard wrestling. Obviously that leads to a point where you want to go train somewhere. Um, who did you go with and and you know, how did you uh, find your way to training before getting into the business? Well, I'm, as you guys would call it, Bogan. I'm, a, I'm an American <laughs> redneck. So I didn't have money uh, growing up and my family didn't support wrestling at all. They thought it was a fab and that I'd grow out of it and shit. So uh, me and my buddies being the smart asses that we are, we all pitched in and got a 12 by 12 boxing ring that was stiff as concrete. Like, yeah. You want to know why I, I can fall on my back as often as I do? It's because I literally learned how to bump in a stiff ass fucking ring. Like <laughs> WWE, I could probably go bump in their ring and they'd be like, oh, how's it feel? And I'd be like, eh, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh one of our buddies, the place we kept the ring, he actually went and got trained at a place called GCW, uh, Gateway Championship Wrestling down in St. Louis. Uh, Matt Seidel, uh, Delirious, like Daisy Hayes, Mischief, they all trained there at one point and, you know, kind of honed their, their craft there a little bit. Uh, so we were essentially getting secondhand training from them through okay. our buddy because you go learn come back rest up the very next day we'd all be his students and that's why i learned how to do all my chain my chain wrestling stuff and all my bump properly right away because i was being taught how to do it properly it's just i wasn't being trained by someone with notice or notoriety right the, the weekend i turned 18 i went and fucking did an indie show and i've been wrestling ever since on the indies so I, I definitely got secondhand information or secondhand training as far as the bumps and all that. Uh, the hooligans in 2009 kind of retooled me as far as my psychology goes, how I tell stories in the ring and like really defined how I am now because, you know, bumps can only get you so much and people will call you spot monkeys all day long. 
Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and, and that's funny because I, when I trained to wrestle, I was trained by a guy who was trained by Lance Storm. So uh, I, I get what you mean by the secondhand uh, training thing. Yeah, uh, <laughs> just that your secondhand training was way better than my secondhand training. <laughs> Um, so uh, you said 18 year, years old, you had your first match. Uh, do, do you have any memories of the first match? How did it go? Uh, I want to say it was a one-on-one, but I cannot remember who it was. I'd have to ask uh, Gary J. He's saying, you know who Gary J is? No. He's a robo gender. Like, he, he's real big on the uh, strong style kind of stuff. Oh, okay, uh, right. Yeah, look, look him up. He's actually really worth looking into. Him and uh, Aaron Williams are uh, unsigned and don't care. If you okay, around. cool. That's a good name. Um, yeah, same. both of them are <laughs> phenomenal workers. Like the only reason why I bring Gary J up is because like he's the one person I've been in the business longer with anyone else in. Uh, there's one other guy, but you know, <laughs> he runs his own little thing and does his own little thing. Um, but yeah, like I, I don't remember who I worked, but I'm 90. I, I literally showed up to the show just hoping to get on. And they were like, oh, anyone want to get in the ring and screw around? I was like, I will. I, I, I haven't been on the show yet. So I went in there and started doing a couple bumps. They're like, you want to be on the show? And I was like, yeah, sure. <laughs> like, yeah, I don't, you know, trying to be cool about it. And then uh, you go out, do the match. And they're like, you're going to be Seamus Od- or Seamus, uh, Seamus something. We need you to be Irish. Like problem. I'm not Irish. They're like, you got red in your beard. And I'm like, having red hair does not make you Irish. It means you're a genetic freak. That's a genetic like problem. It's not a natural hair color. And like they I would always find some way of like trying to get in their in their way with it as far as their gimmick ideas and it just shame is so flannery stuck and uh kind of went out for a good six six months for them doing that. And then I jumped on the indies and I was just a guy named Sly. <laughs> so <laughs> did that for years and I eventually made it to IWA and Ian Ryan gave me the Neil Diamond Cutter gimmick. And I right. So sometimes you go through a few gimmicks before you get to the right one. Yeah, well, yeah, humble beginnings is the shame is all flannery. Um, and moving forward, gaining opportunities. I I, I need to say it because uh uh, I've been looking at the name all day and I was just like laughing about it because it's just the perfect name to say in an Irish accent. Um, so you, you gain these opportunities, you get to go to IWA Mid-South. Um, I'm guessing uh, the Neil Diamond Cutter name kind of comes in because there's a, there's a team called the Hooligans. It's Devin and Mason Cutter. Do you become like a, is this like the the Anderson family where 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 there's the there's the Cutter family and you, you've been bestowed the 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 surname? Is that is that how that worked? Uh it's more like the Dudleys. Right. Like they they were Ray and Devon and I was Spike. And we just kind of tacked dudes on as as we needed. Like uh, as soon as I left, like from 2012 to 2015, I took a little bit of a break. I had a child, so had to reprioritize my life to make sure he was all set to go. Who me and him apparently have the same kind of like ancestry because we both have those long kind of slender faces, kind of like Necro. He has that long kind of slender face Uh, where Mason and Devin, they have kind of round basketball looking heads. So like you could tell that they're, there's no real like family resemblance per se. Uh, come to find out, like I I actually am related to Devin and Mason, like we're second cousins or something like that. So like it's so weird. I was like, man, it's such a small world, <laughs> you know. So awesome, but, uh, Ian got the Ian got up uh, with the idea for me being Neil Diamond because he got really stoned with Mickey Knuckles one night, and uh, they were watching Saving Silverman. Have you ever seen that? I have not, no. Uh, okay, uh, Jason Bateman, Jack Black, or not Jason Bateman, uh, the dude from American Pie. Uh, from American um, Pie. Jason, Jason Biggs. Jason Briggs. Yeah, yeah, that's his name. Uh, uh, gosh, Jack Black and uh, Sean something. Um, 
gosh, I can't remember the last dude's name. Uh, you remember the movie Sierra with Matthew McConaughey? No, I haven't seen that one either. <laughs> See, I'm going <laughs> to think of like 30 movies to find this one dude. Uh, Steve Zahn, that's his name. Okay. Uh, yep. Zane. Yeah. Uh, so it's these three friends. And they're all huge Di- Neil Diamond marks. Like they sit, they stand in a park and they play Neil Diamond and stuff and sing along, dressed in <laughs> sequins and shit. Well, uh, Ian was thinking, he's like, well, that, that sly kid, he likes making fun of himself. Neil Diamond Cutter. Oh, we can put him with the hooligans. He can be Neil Diamond Cutter, come out to Sweet Caroline, all that jazz. I thought I was being ripped. I was like, nah, they're not going to want me to come out to Neil Diamond. Like, that's silly, dumb shit. I'm a serious wrestler. <laughs> <laughs> nope, pure shit. They're like, no, you're coming out of the Neil Diamond. Like, this ain't no joke. This ain't no rib. Like, this is what we want you to do. And for the next like three months, I got my ass whooped by like Sammy Callahan and John Moxley, Mickey Knuckles, the Thomas Sellies. Like, they just kind of let me get beat up to see if I'd take it and do it with a smile. And luckily, I did. And like, and they they started giving me better better opponents as time went on, and just you know start building it up. But all that sparked from from ian and mickey thinking neil could be all three of these characters rolled into one so i'm just <laughs> waiting for someone to challenge me in the ring and be like tell me something i don't know neil just so i could pull a line from that movie be like yeah i got third testicle <laughs> so, um a, a, an opportunity Absolutely, bro. Um, and I, th- I thought this was interesting. Um, and I'm sure you've been asked about this plenty of times. It's the 23rd of April, 2010, at the Bellevue Plaza in Illinois. Um, it- it's the Prince of the Death Matches tournament. Uh, and I, I just love. I-, I always love when I have you guys on. I love going through the the matches that you had on the day and the names because it's just crazy. First round, you defeat John Moxley in a whiskey shots Taipei death match. In the semifinal, it's an unlucky 13 fish hooks match against Kyle Threat. And in the final against Marcus Crane in an ultimate hardcore X and no rope barbed wire match. That's that's a hard day at the office, uh, office there. Um <laughs> <laughs> do you have any fun stories of uh of this day? Uh, as obviously you 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 win this uh tournament. Um and you know it's a pretty big moment in you know in your career. Yeah, definitely. Um, the thing that st- <laughs> uh, one thing that stands out is uh, hearing CZW guys tell John Moxley like, "What are you doing? Put it over this green kid," you know. And at this time, I'm almost a decade into wrestling, so I'm like, "Green kid, like, what the fuck are these guys talking about?" You know, and and retrospective you know hindsight's 2020 like i was very green back then still you know i knew all my bumps and shit my back my backstage etiquette was the lacking part of it so like hearing john tell these dudes like guys who cares if i'm a champion so this is a totally different company like and the way we got the ending worked out it should work out great for both of us you know, and as you know from the match, you know, he does the airplane spin and he gets so trashed, he just passes out and I just get lucky and pin him. <laughs> so, like, it just goes to show that even though you're a champion somewhere, you can still tell a really good story. And plus, him coming out and then being like, no, I want to do Neil Diamond, play that shit again. And then singing that, like, there's a couple of clips of it up on YouTube and all of them are close to 20,000, if not more views high. So I'm like, go for it, John. Do whatever the fuck you want, dude. You know what the fuck you're doing. Um, <laughs> the other thing that stands out is uh, Kyle Threat does, is squirmish. So, like, me being the guy I am trying to get over and trying to get, you know, shocking on shit, I'm like, hey, take a fish hook and put it through my lip. <laughs> you know, I have, pier- I have piercings and shit, so it doesn't bother me, you know. And he just looks at me all worried. Oh, uh, I, I, I don't do well with needles. I'm like, what are you doing in a fish hook match then? Like, are you <laughs> what? Like, I want him to go all the way through and actually hook me because that's safer than just getting stabbed with it and having to dangle there, you know. <laughs> Again, no. <laughs> Not a single one went through me like that. And I was like, oh, 
But it just made me laugh because he was so squirmish about it. I'm like, you got tattoos and shit. Like, <laughs> how can you be squirmish with this stuff? Like, I don't get it. But the, those are the two most like standout things I can think of from from Prince. The out of everything. Right, fair enough. Uh, and another thing that I just thought was insane: you, you did three of these matches in one day, but then you wrestled the next day in Litchfield. Uh, for a show called April Blood Showers in a seven-way scramble match for IWA Mid-South. I would have thought that after going through a whole like deathmatch tournament in one day, you might need a couple of days rest. That's what you would assume, but for whatever reason, you're working the next day in another town. How, how are you capable of doing this at, at this point? Uh, adrenaline, a lot of drugs. Uh, <laughs> um like to be honest, uh, me and Marcus both looked at each other the next day, and I was like, "How you doing?" He's like, "Uh, I'm like, yeah, same. I don't really want to do much." And if you actually watch that scramble, like me and him just kind of come in and go. We don't really <laughs> uh, uh, tell a story per se. I think I have a standoff in that match, but that's about it. Uh, I think Dan the Man was in there too. And I got so excited because I got tagged in. I was like, oh, I'm going to suplex this motherfucker in the, in the fucking jersey. <laughs> fucking run up and give him a Saido or something. And, like, uh, I just remember it being the adrenaline usually is what uh, causes you to kind of get through it all. Because you'll, your adrenaline will just kick on and everything will go, I wouldn't say go numb, but, like, you just don't feel nearly as much. Like, right now, I have nerve damage in my hand that if I hit here, it'll travel all the way up my index finger on the side here, and then it'll also go all the way up my thumb. And, like, right now, I can't feel the tip of my thumb. Right. So, you know, adrenaline, guaranteed, next match I have, adrenaline will go off, and I'll be able to, like, fully use my hand and not feel anything from it. So what happened with uh, Sage Sin, I went through three – yeah, three matches before her on Sunday, last Sunday. And, like, right before I went out, I could feel my whole hand just stop hurting. So Really? Adrenaline, yeah, adrenaline does some weird shit to you, man. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. Like, I, have, I know someone who does the hook stuff, like slack, where they get hook up on meat hooks and shit. And I'm just oh like, my what God. causes you to do that? Yeah, I know this tiny little girl that does it. <laughs> I'll be like, what business is you to do this? She's like, what business is you to get hit in the head with gussets? And I'm like, touche. <laughs> like, at, least not destroying, at least you're not destroying your body like I am. Um, awesome, bro. Uh, so uh, June of the same year, uh, you compete in your first ever King of the Deathmatch tournament. So uh, the prince enters the, the king's domain here. Uh you, you defeat uh, Devin Cutter in a Four Corners of Pain match. Wax uh, in the next uh, the next day in a light tube log cabin match before being defeated by Devin Moore in the uh, semifinal in a barbed wire dog collar match, which sounds mental. I haven't seen this, though. Um, tell me a little bit about this day. I, I guess this is your first King of the Death match tournament, right? So um, uh, any stories from this day? <laughs> Uh, hmm. what was it? Ian told me that since I won Prince, I got to pick my first opponent for King. So I picked Devin and, uh, my, my biological father actually passed away a couple weeks, uh, like a couple years and a couple weeks before my first King. So I wore one of his shirts, uh, to pay tribute to my dad. Cause he never got to watch me wrestle. And he was apparently really proud of me. He just never said it to me. All right. So, uh, uh, sadly, someone stole that shirt that night, so I'll never get that back. Uh, luckily, yeah. I got more shirts than my dad, so no biggie. But yeah. um, I remember doing that match and everything being like, hell yeah. And if you actually watch me and Devin, you can see Balls Mahoney in the background sitting at the side of the, the curtain. And at the end of the match, you just see him like give that nod of approval, get up and walk off. And I was like, hell yeah. Balls Mahoney at least liked it. <laughs> so. Uh, that was really fun. Um, the next day against Wax, that was rough. Like, if Prince was me putting my, like, toe in, into the pool of death matches, me versus Wax was me diving headfirst into the pool with no water in it. 
Right. Like it was way rougher than it needed to be. And uh, like he DVD'd me off a fucking apron to the fucking gymnasium floor into a log cabin. Not a wise decision. <laughs> um, and uh, Devin Moore actually was like, hey, hey, brother, you want to borrow some uh, elbow pads? You know, you got your glass all over your fucking elbows and shit. And I'm like, <laughs> nah, I'll be all right. It's it's whatever. And then at the end of the match, I re- reverse a belly to back, and my elbows go right through a cabin. If I can, <laughs> you can see it on the video, like I'm kind of hunched up like this, and then the ref grabs my hand and kind of yanks it. I'm like, no, don't do that. Fucking, I'm all cut up. <laughs> and then as soon as my hands lift up, you just see the blood just starting to pour down. Oh and, like, god! You just see, I am not in a good shape at that point. <laughs> and uh, you, you definitely see it in the third round against Devin because we're attached by a dog collar that has a chain a re- barbed wire wrapped around the chain. Good job. So, yeah, the, in hindsight, we should have just took the fuckers off. It would have been way better. My hands, like, my hands were stuck like this, like in the L shape because I had yeah. to duct tape my own arms shut so they wouldn't bleed all over. And no <laughs> one would help me. So I'm stuck like this. You know, walking around the ring, you can see me. I try to throw a forearm, and like I just cannot bend my arm, my elbow. So I go to punches, and they look weak. Like I owe Devin Moore a match for that, but you know what can you do? <laughs> I love the stories, bro. It's it's really fun uh, hearing these little stories, um, and it's great that you get you get the the nod from Balls Mahoney there. Um, I, I've asked every death match guy we've had on the show. Oh, sorry, did you want to say something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just thought of something else. Uh, sure. Actually, at Goddess of Gore this year, two of my really good friends were in the finals, Mickey Knuckles and Randy West. When that comes out, check it out. They are fucking brutal. But uh, I saw I was the weapon master for the uh, tournament, so I had to organize all the weapons, make them all, you know, make sure they're all good and shit. Well, they tell me the finals is a all barbed wire dog collar match. And I'm like, are you fucking crazy? Like, that shit don't work. <laughs> like, I've done one. They don't work. I'm telling you, this ain't going to work. Well, uh, they convinced me to still, instead of having a chain in between, they just had me cut two long snips of barbed wire. And I'm like, okay, that's better than having a chain linking them and then that getting all fucked up and shit. Well, <laughs> they had me come out during the finals and go, no, 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 no. If you bitches going to be crazy, let's get fucking crazy. And I put dog collars on them to put the, to link them together with the barbed wire. And then like five <laughs> minutes later, they take them off. It's like Neil and his dumb ass shit. And I I just thought of that. I was like, it's ironic that that King, you bring it up. That I was in a dog collar barbed wire match. And then fucking, I just did it. For someone else, and I'm like, haha, I don't have to be in it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so as uh, I was asking before, I've asked every death match guy we've had on the show this same question, whether it's Masada or Matt Tremont or or uh, Thumbtack Jack, etc. The morning of a death match tournament or just the day before it begins, the atmosphere in the air. Can you tell me what the what it feels like knowing that something as hectic as a deathmatch tournament's about to take place. Do, do you feel anything? Is 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 there anything to that with you? Or is it like, uh, I, you know, I think uh, Masada was like, eh, it's just another day of the office. But some people feel differently. Thumbtack Jack felt differently. So do you feel differently? Uh, it kind of depends on where I'm at. Like, if I go to IW, uh, IWA Deep South for their Carnage Cup, I'm going to look around and be like, what the fuck did I set up for? because you know they got no rope barbed wire flaming barbed wire matches and like i went down for carnage cup eight and i walk up to the owner i'm like hey kevin you guys got buckets of water or towels or fire extinguishers anything to put these guys out in case they actually catch on fire because the finals was a no rope flaming barbed wire match and he goes oh man oh oh shit he turns and waddles off and I'm just like, oh, God. <laughs> so I walk up to Tremont. Hey, Tremont, just let you know, they don't have anything to put you out except for dirt. He's like, oh, <laughs> fuck off, man. And he walks off going to chase after Kevin. 
And I'm just like, oh, man, what did we sign up for here? I, I, I think the dude from Deep South wants to see someone die, like legit <laughs> die in front of him. Uh, but if I go to like something like King, like the first couple were really hectic because I was a part of the Weapon Mastery stuff. So I had to set up gimmicks and make sure shit was coming together as the tournament went along and shit. Where now, if I go to a tournament, it really doesn't matter where it's at. I'm usually pretty calm about it. Like, I know what I'm doing. I know what what I have to do is just what kind of shit am I going to have out there, you know? Like, there's still yeah. a few things I haven't really worked with, like razor boards I haven't really fucked with yet, gusset boards I really haven't fucked with. It just kind of depends on what, what kind of show or uh, what kind of tournament it is. Um, like AWR, I've been to both of their tournaments and, uh, like it was hectic, but it was still pretty calm. Um, their ring was probably the, the thing I hated the most, but outside of that, everything else was fine. Um, the Crimson Crowns I've been out for, for their Crimson Cups and stuff. Those have always been nice and smooth. Uh, yeah, usually when it comes to tournaments, I don't. I used to get the butterflies and yeah. then be like, oh, shit, this could be really big. But now it's come to the point where I'm like, nah, this is part of my legacy. Like, I've only been eliminated three times in the first round. Like, that's something I really want to hang on to because yeah. two out of the three dudes won their tournament. You know, Drake Younger was one, Schlack was the other, and Bobby Beverly beat me. At, at Sickness Cup in the first round, he just he didn't go on to win, but fucking he definitely took it to me. But yeah, I don't I don't really get butterflies or anything like that anymore, except for when I'm standing right on the outskirts of the uh, curtain right before I go out. That that minute and a half build up to my chorus, usually I'm thinking like, ah, oh, something go wrong, or you know, I hope I remember everything, or you know, this that or the other <laughs> thing. I hope they react right. You yeah. Know? So. I understand. Um, and I, in my research, I'd seen that you, you, I might be wrong. The internet can be wrong sometimes. Uh, but I, I've seen that you have never participated in a Masters of Pain or a, or a Tournament of Death. Um, would, would those be two tournaments that you would be interested in, in performing on? Oh, yeah, definitely. Uh, like when I saw there was a Masters of Pain uh, this year. Um, yeah. I was actually waiting to get some type of inv invitation because it's widely known that I'm a tournament guy, especially on the inside. You know, everyone knows I love tournaments because I love begging out two or three death matches in a day. And, uh, yeah, I, I actually felt a little insulted when uh, when they released the lineup and I and they didn't give me a call or anything. I was actually pretty, pretty sour pushed about it. I was like, nah, dude, I'm, I'm on the verge – of like really getting my name out there so at the time i was like nah dude that ain't cool like you got all these young kids in i get that but i'm better than some of these dudes like i'm gonna have a better quality type of match than they would you know not taking anything away from them it's just i know me and i know what i'm capable of doing any, any show you put me on you're gonna get 120 percent of my my effort into it especially if it's a death match. But, like, yeah, I kind of got sour push towards, uh, <laughs> towards uh, uh, Master of Pain because I was like, I should at least got an invite, you know, even if I was scheduled somewhere else, so I assume that's why I never got an invite because it was, it was always known I was taking up that date. So mm -hmm. I'm assuming that's why I never got the invite. But, like, uh, TOD, I would have loved to be in that. Uh, with all the heat that surrounded JD and uh, the whole mistreating or selling off the women's stuff and sexualizing it. I'm not saying he did any of that stuff, but that put a very sour taste in my mouth because, you know, it, you shouldn't, even if you don't understand that that's what the company that's buying it from you is doing, once you find that out, you break ties with that company. You know, you show respect to your workers. Money is not higher than respect. Not in my eyes, at least. Otherwise, I'd be fucking rich. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, I understand. So, well, maybe next year, Masters of Pain might might send you an invite. Um, yeah, I'm hoping. 
I just I just fought Pondo, so hopefully he liked me enough. I let him slice my face up enough. <laughs> um, so through all these years, is wrestling solely paying the bills, or is there something else that you're doing to get by? Do you do you have a job on the side? Um, because you can't be doing a death match, you know, uh, five, six days a week. So, uh, how, how's that worked in your life? Oh, was it at the beginning of the year? I actually did have a, another job. Uh, and then one day I look up, I'm leaning on a counter because my back is just killing me so bad. I think I got, um, I think it was shortly after Bever Bobby Beverly gave me a snap suplex onto a sideways chair. Like it legit fucked my back up for a good two months. And um, when I walked in or I'm working in whatever, and I'm leaning over on the counter and I look up like this and I look around and I just see three idiots standing there, not doing their job, not helping, staring at me as I am in miserable pain. And these people know I don't cry for shit. And I'm about to, to start crying because my back hurts so much. Well, about an hour later, I'm off work. I'm on my way, home, like, walking home. And I'm like, not worth, I'm not being treated the way I should be treated. I'm not being showed the respect that I deserve. And, fucking, I am not being valued at the worth that I'm valued at. So, literally on the way home, I was like, I can't do this no more and quit my job. Or quit my second job. So, now this is my full... <clears throat> this is my full-time job i'm trying to keep up on patreon and and trying to get more connected with fans I, i'm a pretty accessible guy so i guess uh patreon doesn't really appeal to too many people but uh, i'm definitely trying to go down that route a little bit and i'm up to three subscribers <laughs> a big lot in three so ho hopefully it'll pick up more and and Patreon will kind of become a job unto itself because wrestling is uh, definitely helping or it's definitely paying the bills, or at least it can. Um, it's just I got to keep doing big double shots and, and right. doing three or four matches in a weekend, and I'm, I'm pretty much set. So, so about six, seven months now, I wrestling has been the only job. So awesome. I'm quite lucky. That, that's pretty cool, man. Like, uh, I just imagine it will be just difficult, uh, in, especially the genre of wrestling that you are most well known for, to be doing this three, four times a weekend. You know, um, all, all the credit to you there um, for, for putting yourself through all that. Um, but you, you, your name is getting out there. And hey, three Patreon subscribers, that's three more than what we have with our uh, podcast. So you're doing well. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, uh, yes, uh, you did mention before that um, you had that gap of time um, when um, you had a child born. Um, so that's like, was that like a good three, four years of time? And and during that time, how did you feel, you know, because uh, you, were, you were so prominent at one stage, then there's this gap. Are you still in touch with people in touch with the scene of what's going on or is it kind of like out of sight out of mind how did you feel um you know during your time away and not being able to have that adrenaline rush every weekend uh well was when i first quit it was kind of like what do i do now you know but uh my son you know was was the one bright spot that i was like all right this is my legacy in life in general so i can't really focus with the wrestling, got to go make sure he's set up properly. And for about three and a half years, I didn't wrestle. Uh, that's why there's such a big gap. I moved to Phoenix, Arizona, where wrestling is pretty much dead. And uh, everyone down there thinks they're going to join the WWF, which is not true. None of them are. <laughs> or most of them are not nearly as capable of, of being part of the Fed. So, and they think they're going to get, a roster spot by being an extra and i'm like why the fuck would they why would they hire extras to be actual workers like i don't know I, i've never heard of someone going from an extra to a worker so that that always boggled me yeah um but during that time period when i was off i, I actually got my cdl and became a truck driver 
So there, there's a big joke uh, going around with Randy West uh, where she'll just randomly walk up and be like, hey, did you know Neil used to be a trucker? Because apparently I said it like six or seven times within an hour to her. You know, so high and just so tired and, you know, just for some reason, <laughs> trucking just kept, just kept coming up. So now it's a big joke between everyone where I'm like, yeah, yeah, you know, I used to be a trucker. So <laughs> that's, the, that's the one big uh, gag down there. <laughs> that's pro. Um, uh, another question I had. Well, what if you could pick one? What's your favorite deathmatch stipulation you've been in? Um, I haven't seen this one, but in my research, I laughed at the Christmas tree deathmatch. I, I, I want to see that. That sounds funny. Um, but do you have a favorite deathmatch stipulation uh, to to perform in? Uh, the gimmick, the holiday gimmick ones are always a lot of fun, um, unless they involve like candy or like something sticky. I'm not uh, big on like feeling sticky afterwards. Like I'd rather just feel bloody and smell irony. But um, <laughs> you know, like with Sage Sin, we just did a that pumpkin patch death match, and she just shoved a shitload of pumpkin seeds in my mouth. And like <laughs> legit, I was just like, "Oh, this does not taste good." Then she gave me a European uppercut. I spit it all out. I start gagging. <laughs> Because some of it didn't want to go up. It just started going back down. I was like, no. Ah! Was throwing up in the rain. Uh, just off the top of my head, it's usually when it's a mix of shit. A uh, good example, like me and Dale Patrick's uh, number two at ICW uh, Lucky 13. Like that, that match put me on the map and Dale. Like, instantly, we became stars overnight on that one match. Um, but, like, there was a good mix of shit in there. Like, there was a random skateboard with tacks on it. We had cinder blocks, uh, cactuses, which never again. I will never do cactuses <laughs> again. Fuck that shit. <laughs> I pulled 27 cactus needles out of my goddamn head. Because of that match, so. <laughs> yeah, I'm good on cactuses. <laughs> um, but usually when it's, like, a when it's a good mix of stuff is when I usually excel the best. Cause it means I have a variety of things I can do where if you only have barbed wire, you can only do so much with barbed wire, same with tax or light tubes. Any, any one thing of excess I think can be a bit much, but when you start mixing in everything else is when you start getting improv and, and kind of special moments that aren't planned. So for me, it's usually a mix of everything. I like having a little bit of everything in there. All right, that's cool, bro. Uh, one thing that I, I, I definitely feel like, I, I mean, I, I wouldn't do a whole lot, but what, the one that I d dislike the idea of the most is, you know, the, the Kenzan thing where they, they, they get it knocked into, you, into your head and you have to have it pulled out with pliers. That, that looks horrible. Have you ever done that? Not yet. <laughs> you were there yet. I'm sure somebody will. Somebody will get me with it. Shit. <laughs> um, I saw a tweet. I think you, you put I, out I the other day. Out, I just pulled out a skewer piece from Masada about two <laughs> days ago that was stuck in my head. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, dude. I was just playing with it, and all of a sudden, oh, look at that skewer piece. It happened. <laughs> Yeah, I saw a tweet you put out the other day about uh, pulling a piece of glass out of yourself um, that had been yeah, in there for a little while. <laughs> yeah, that was only there for a couple of days, so it wasn't too bad. <laughs> how many how many bed sheets have you ruined over the years from doing all this? More than I can count. <laughs> <laughs> like, I, I honestly couldn't tell you. The, the question would be more like, how many hotel sheets have I ruined? <laughs> with my blood that'd be a better question probably a much higher one so i, I would more more be curious about that i know i freak people out because i'll walk in just covered in blood and people will be like you okay I'm like yeah this is what you paid to do where's, where's my room that's all i care like, oh, God. it's uh, a job I, like no I, other oh dude uh i got done with my first match in orlando and not thinking about it, I get all cleaned up for the airport and all this jazz, and I put on my jacket. 
not thinking about it, I wore it during the match. So I walk into the airport, and you've been to an airport before. It's all bright and crisp looking. I look down, and I'm covered in blood. My whole jacket is covered. And I'm like, oh, they probably think I just fucking stabbed somebody. Shit. So I quickly <laughs> pack that shit up and put it away. I was like, oh, I don't want anyone calling the cops thinking I fucking just jacked someone in the bathroom or something. <laughs> But that, that was probably one of the, like, coolest moments I think I've had in wrestling where I just walk in, just look down, not realize I'm covered in blood. Like, <laughs> I want the cops seeing that shit. Have you ever, uh, you know, had a, had a situation where you've been, I don't know, in, like, some sort of, like, uh, public setting, maybe it's a party or a barbecue or some, what, whatever it could be, some sort of setting where you might run into somebody who doesn't know anything about wrestling or deathmatch wrestling and they ask you what it is that you do for a living how do you explain to them what it is that you do uh i tell them i believe for money and they're like what and then i'll show show them some random clip like last night actually good example my uh neighbor works at the gas station so i went up there and got some soda and whatnot and he's like hey man you do that uh uh, shit on like impact, right? Like that, that wrestling shit, like barbed wire and stuff. And I'm like, no, I do like wooden skewers and light tubes and tacks. Like, you name something sharp, I've landed on it, most likely. <laughs> he goes, oh no, man, like, I don't believe you. I'm like, okay. So I pulled up, uh, me, uh, skewering Percy Drews for the first time. And fuck it, I get a nice, I, I did get permission from Masada. He said, I am allowed to do it. So I skewered him and got the nice little mushroom on the head. He did and Percy had no idea this was coming. So I went over and I grabbed the chair. I was like, I'm going to fucking blast him. So wait until he looked at me and just Why? He wrapped the chair around his fucking head. So I show him that clip. The dude's like, you're fucking crazy. I was like, I told you whenever when I first met. What did I say? My name and I am crazy. <laughs> so, had a nice little shock value out of him. <laughs> Very nice, bro. I like hearing stuff like that. Um, ICW No Holds Bar. This seems to be like a home for you at the moment. Um, tell me about you know what it's like to 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 work for this company, and for anyone out there watching this that might not be aware of of the company, or or you know, please uh, <laughs> tell them about it. Uh, I be you no holds bar. Uh, was it some way Murdoch actually brought them up to me uh, at the beginning of the pandemic because they were just about to start. And uh, the way he sold it to me, he was like, "Oh, it's kind of a shoot, kind of not." And I was like, "Man, I don't want to go out there and like have to actually defend myself. Like, I want to go out there and have fun." <laughs> you know. So I was like, "You know what? I'm gonna take the time off and." and really get some money behind me with my other job and all that and just take the time off to be safe. You know, I have a 70 year old mother I live with that I, that I look after and stuff. So, uh, you know, I, I just wanted to make sure that I was good during this pandemic because we still didn't have any fucking information. Like you guys just went on lockdown. We just went on lockdown and like everything stopped basically, except for ICW. They just kind of kept rolling with it and just kept going and, and really didn't give any fucks. And not until uh, Insane 8, I thought I told Dysfunction uh, that if Insane 8 doesn't work the way I want it to, I'm going to quit wrestling. And he was like, why? I was like, the pandemic shut everything down, dude. Like, I thought I was on the verge of, like, becoming a star. And now everything's locked down. Like, there's no hope. There's just, who knows if we'll ever get out of this. And if we do, will I ever get to that notoriety well insane eight happens i go through three really good matches and the last one despite it being uh short everyone says one of the most brutal matches i've ever seen i'm like yeah it's supposed to be that way fast brutal and fucking violent as shit and uh from my my performance at insane eight I got the invite to come down to ICW and actually horror story will actually be my one year anniversary with them. So I'm literally coming up on an anniversary show. 
or, or at least for me, an anniversary show. Um, and just kind of from there, once uh, I made it through Ryan, Eric Ryan in the pit, and everyone's like, oh, that was pretty good. I was like, mm, I could do better, though. Like, it's not a ring. Wait till you see me in the ring. And uh, finally got in there with the chains and all that, got to kind of work with them a little bit. And uh, the moment they started chanting Honey Badger at the beginning of the match, I was like, oh, I'm in. I'm <laughs> so in. I just got to do a couple of brutal things, and and they're going to see that I can get over and still I am the embodiment of the Honey Badger. So they're going to see <laughs> that tonight. And against Drexel, they did and got the comeback. And I've been on a tear pretty much since WrestleMania. Like, I've only lost two matches in ICW, and that was against New Jack and Carnage Crew at Mania. And then after that, I only lost to Masada so far. So I'm, like, I think out of the last so many months, I'm, like, 12 and 2. So, like, I've got right. one hell of a record now, and I just keep knocking off these guys. I never thought I wanted to work and, you know, never thought I'd work Pondo honestly thought I'd never work Masada. But yeah. Then, like, just keep <laughs> knocking off those lists, guys, man. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask you about because I noticed in my research that you've worked with Pondo and Masada this year. I didn't realize you were in that match with uh, New Jack and uh, Tony DeVito and uh, uh, HC Loke because um, I, I interviewed Tony the day of that match when – obviously a few months ago now um and i believe this was new jack's last uh matchup as well so uh, uh that's that's yeah, pretty cool last, yeah i'm the last <laughs> dude to ever get hit in the head with a guitar by new jack and i still got a piece, i got a piece of that guitar because uh i was like oh i gotta get a piece of that you know so i broke off a little piece and showed it in my pocket and then like a month later john way murdoch runs up to me he's like Hey man, New Jack's dead. And I'm like, what? what? Like, were we his last match? And he's like, yeah. And I'm like, fuck, that's not cool because he, you know he's gone. But you know, it, at least I can say I I had his last match. You know. Yeah. Holy shit! I did. I forgot that it was so soon after that match that he actually did pass away. Um. But yeah, like, uh, how was it finally getting to wrestle Masada? Oh, dude, that was a dream come true. Uh, like, uh, I, I'm not claiming to be Masada's biggest fan, but he's definitely a dude I, I've researched and, you know, obviously look up to, you know. And um, I, <laughs> I looked at him, and I was like, I know exactly what this is. Like, this is going to be the easiest thing you've ever done. I want you to have fun. So, like that's that's usually my top priority like i just want us to have fun go out there have brutality but let's be fun and safe about it and uh so funny because uh first couple of shots like you can see him kind of being antsy like he wants to go like right there on the spot <laughs> when he first hits me and i just drop he's like you can see him he wants to come at me and just tear me apart but he's trying <laughs> to be nice and polite and uh it, it just cracks me up because looking back, you know, you look back at Masada in 2009, like there's no space like that. Like he'll just come at you and just keep coming at you. And uh, just to see how, how he reacted the way I reacted to him, because no one expects me to, to be like that. You know, you, you're a big dude. You give me a shot. I'm going to make it look like a million bucks. And um, when I rewatched it, seeing him actually, take a Rana and do do a bump I was like he bumped <laughs> holy shit <laughs> <laughs> holy shit she actually bumped for me that's pretty cool you know but it was it was everything I wanted it to be um especially when he skewered me the only thing that sucked was like one got like way over here so like that kind of sucked but that smile was the most genuine smile anyone has ever seen out of out of me like finally and then I saw him <laughs> coming out because the blood was was shooting him out and i was like yes <laughs> yes even better <laughs> so like <clears throat> like i i can't say enough good things about masada and like just i i would really like to work him in a normal ring in a normal match once 
just to see how our styles would clash in that sense because I'm obviously more of a flyer, you know, and he, he's a ground and pounder kind of guy. But we both know what we're doing technically, so I think we'd be able to do, like, a really cool kind of normal straight match if, if we are ever given the chance to. So, but uh, his wife walked up to me afterwards. I, I don't know if he'll get mad at me for saying this. But his wife walked up, and uh, she was like, oh, are you okay? Are you all right? And I'm just, I'm still smiling. Like, yeah, I'm fine. He's a sweetheart. Like, he didn't do anything to me that I wouldn't, you know, like, what? I come from a time where I got beat up, okay? So this is not abnormal to me. Like, everyone's like, no, take your time. Bump cards this, bump cards that. And I was like, bump cards are fake, guys. Like, there's no way of telling when your bump card is ever going to be up. Look at Terry Funk. He's 100 years yeah. old. Guaranteed he could probably bump tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, your, I don't get the whole bump card and all that crap. I, I'm just an old school dude that where if you hit me, you hit me. If you don't, you don't. I, I've come to learn I have a apparently a steel jaw. So <laughs> yeah, awesome but it, it was definitely definitely uh, one of the very few matches I've actually walked from the back to the to the locker room and been like, all right, that was a good match. One of the very few matches I actually I actually did that with. I was like, no, that was everything it needed to be really cool and i very 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 rarely i've only did it twice this year or no three times i did it uh when me and tank worked um when me and masada and me and pondo those are the three times where i got to the back and i was like no those are really good matches those are really good yeah that, that is a good feeling to to feel completely satisfied with the performance. Yeah, you hate walking away from something, regretting one little thing that happens. So uh, it's always good to smell the roses when that kind of thing takes place. Um, uh, another question I had was uh, because, you know, you talk about, you know, you never thought you worked Masada, you never thought you worked Pondo. There's got to be a bunch of other guys on that list that you'd like to tick off and test yourself against. Is Who else is out there that you haven't had the chance to work with yet? Well, sadly, most of them are either retired or uh, passed away, sadly. Like, you, if I had the chance to work one of these three dudes, I, I would probably be kind of fulfilled to a degree. But I really wish I had a chance to work Supreme, uh, Messiah, and Homeless Jimmy. Uh, sadly, Supreme's not with us. Messiah and Homeless Jimmy are now retired. And, like, I, I really wish I could have worked any three of those guys because uh when i came to crimson crown uh the first time uh to actually be part of the tournament i think it was crimson cup two um and you can hear them on commentary like they're kind of making fun of guys and you know poking fun and whatnot and then my song starts playing and they're like who the fuck is this guy like mellowing everyone out before a death match like isn't that kind of <laughs> anti-productive and, like, I come out, I do my thing, and as the match progresses, you hear Supreme and Messiah's, like, attitude change towards me. Because, like, <laughs> they're kind of making fun of me. They're making fun of my the names I gave a lot of my moves because they're all named stupidly. Um, <laughs> but uh, by the end of the match, you hear Supreme. And, uh, essentially, I win the t a tag team match by myself, essentially. Like it, right. it's actually a really good story. It's one of my most proud matches I've ever had, because uh, literally me and some Joe Blow who's never been a death match versus two dudes who are very rare death matches. I think one it's his first death match, the other one it's like his third. I'm like, right. God, I've got more death matches in my first tournament than you guys did, like in general. <laughs> <laughs> But it turned out really, really well. And by the end of the match, Messiah and, and Supreme are both like, that Neil Diamond Cutter dude, he is a fucking work horse. That dude busted his ass in this match. And afterwards, Homeless Jimmy's pulling tacks out of my back. Because I within the first five minutes, of course, I get hit with a tack bat. So I wrestle <laughs> like 15 minutes with tacks in my back the whole time. Um but he's picking him out, and Supreme and Messiah both come up, and they both like, dude, you're fucking crazy. Like, that was awesome. And just right there was enough for me to be like, hell yeah. Like, that's fucking great. 
Dude, so you got three friend. legends around me fucking praising me and helping me out. Like, hell yeah. This is what it should be. This is what the brotherhood should be, you know? That's but, it for um, the validation right there. Mm-hmm. And just to throw out a, like, I never had a list per se. Like, if you would have asked me three years ago, like, who's on your list? I'm like, Masada. And that's it. <laughs> like, there is no list. It's just Masada. <laughs> and people were like, well, why don't you want to work Arrow Boy or this guy or that guy? I'm like, because Masada is the end game. Like, if I can get a Masada, I can retire happy. Now I've got a Masada. I obviously don't want this run to, to stop. So now I got to set the next goal. And the next big goal is Jukasai. But that, that could take some time. You know, obviously, he's halfway across the globe. Yeah. Um, but uh, some guys I would definitely like to cross paths with is like um, Sexy Eddie would be a lot of fun. Um, uh, gosh, I just had like a couple names in my head. Oh, uh, B-Boy, just because I, I've, I've known him for such a long time. I met him in 2010, King of Death. And uh, just slow, you know, we never really talked wrestling per se, but we always kept up with each other on Facebook. Um, you know, I, I give him support when he needs it. He gives me support when I need it. I actually, we just did a video chat with him at uh, Crimson Crown on uh, uh, Sunday. Now he's even telling him on the video, like, bitch, get back in the ring. We need to fucking tango. <laughs> you know, just kind of goof it off with him. Um, uh, but I would like to have kind of a normal straight match with him just because I think that most people know me as just a deathmatch guy. What most people don't know is us deathmatch guys can wrestle. They That's just it. They prefer not to. You know, so yeah. if I could get like, if I could get B Boy or Homicide, even uh, like those two, I could really test my metal against and not even need weapons. You know, um, as far as death matches go, it's really hard to like nail down like old school dudes. And I've been trying to think of that for a while now. It's hard because a lot of dudes are retired or they passed away or they just don't have any interest in doing death matches anymore. Yeah, and finding like when um, Danny DeMonte ran up to me uh, during Mania and he's like, uh, I don't think Jeff King's going to show. Are you okay with working tank? And I was like, yes, please. <laughs> I, like, I never thought I'd work tank. Like, hell yeah, let's do this. And, uh, I think a month later I got insane lane and I was like, what is, what is going on? Like, I just got transported into the weirdest fucking world ever because you know, I I thought both of them retired, you know, and then come to find out they both did, you know. Uh, <laughs> and I noticed since uh, since I've come back uh, in full force since Insane 8 last year, um, I've noticed a lot of people from either right before my generation or in my generation are starting to come back to death matches. Randy West, Mickey Knuckles, Tank, Insane Lane. Like, all these people are having a resurgence right now. And I'm not trying to say I'm the reason for it, but I think me getting that big shine in Insane 8 showed that and if you're older and have done this, but you know what you're doing, you can still have a run at this. So it, it's just really hard trying to think of other opponents. I think it'd be fun if uh, me and that Darren M- McCarty, the Red Wing, dude that was just at the last show i think it'd be great if me and him tag teamed and called ourselves the goons or something you know <laughs> just, you just kind of a goof off match you know but who knows so but you I, um... i'm sure i'm sure danny will pull something out of his butt and he'll like pull some guys and i'll just be like i never thought yeah i'll be more than happy to work that guy you got no <laughs> problem fighting that dude yeah so. <laughs> Would you like to uh, wrestle in Japan? That's the end game. Yeah. Like my like my legit career end game is to wrestle Jugasai in Japan for freedom. Like that is my end goal. Once that happens, I'll probably like him, uh, Takeda, and I always fuck up his name. I want to say it's uh, a Shati um, Sakuda, Takeda. Um, 
Hang on. I believe, uh, talking, I believe it's Cicada because he's got fucking blue hair. Like, he got the needle through his fucking cheek all the way through. Let's have a look. I don't know. I, I know. I, know. I, I think, I, I mean, I know who you're talking about. I just, uh, I'm not very good with the names either sometimes. <laughs> it's like S U K A D A. I don't know if you're good at spelling, but. S U K A D A. Jeez, Google's not my friend right now. Uh, Toshiyuki, Toshiyuki Sakuda. Sakuda, yeah, there you go. Yeah, Sakuda. The feature of de Japanese deathmatch wrestling is the name of an article there. So there uh, you go. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. Three dudes, if I can make it to Japan and wrestle those three, the, you know, there's really nowhere else to go after that. Um, and I'll never make it to the Fed. So <laughs> no urge to go to the Fed. <laughs> <laughs> but like, yeah, uh, I I want to be a world renowned wrestler. Like, I want to be known as one of the best in the world. Right now, I feel like I'm one of the best in the states, right underneath John and uh, Cologne. So, like, I, I really feel I'm getting to that that pinnacle. I just got to be able to outdo two dudes basically in the states, and I'm pretty much good because no one's gonna reach Gage. No one's gonna reach him. <laughs> Yeah, so, that's, that's a tough one right there, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, man, I I don't want to go through all the shit he had to go through in order to get to that, that point. So. <laughs> <laughs> no, he, I think he's earned it. Uh, <laughs> um, okay, uh, the, the next thing I wanted to ask you was, you know, what, what else is in the pipeline coming up in the next few months? Um, I know you, 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 you're there at uh, ICW. Um, anything else that you want to let any of your fans out there know uh, is, is in the pipeline for you uh, going into 2022? Uh, well, I just finished my paperwork for getting my passport. So I'm, I'm hoping that by the end or by the beginning of 2022, I'll be going to Canada, Mexico. Uh, you're going to have to come out to a show because I know uh, Deathmatch Down Under wants to bring me down. So uh, you come out to that show and I will point out rape to you. <laughs> Look at that guy. Look at that guy. I want to see a podcast rumble right now. <laughs> so you guys just run over and like start slapping each other. You're like, ah! <laughs> oh, that's cool. You might be coming to Deathmatch Down Under. It's on the other side of the country. Um, but hopefully by 2022, I'll be able to actually leave my state. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm sure I'm sure the COVID thing will die off at some point. But that's really cool to know that there's a possibility of that. I actually even heard that Pondo might be coming down to wrestle there as well. So that could be interesting. Yeah, yeah. If you ever get a chance, like, just talk to him about the most random thing. Like, <laughs> the first time I ever met Pondo, I was at some podunk show up in Illinois. And, uh, you know, we all want to hang out, you know, being young kids, we want to hang out with the stars. And uh, Hondo's like, what do you guys all want to do? And we're all like, whatever you want to do, man. He's like, all right, we're going to the pawn shop. Or I thought he said pawn shop. And I was like, what are we going to do a pawn shop at 1 a.m. in the morning? They're all closed. <laughs> no, I just heard him. He said porn shop. So we're walking around a porn shop at 2 a.m. in the morning with Man Man Pondo just looking at stuff. <laughs> like we're literally all just window shopping in a big line of people and the I wanna know what the store clerk was wondering. Like what are all these weirdos just walking in a line looking <laughs> at uh, awesome bro. Yeah, if you ever get a chance to sit down and talk to him, he's he's a I have buddy. actually. Yeah. Uh about two weeks ago I think it was. So I got the chance to talk to him. So he was hilarious. Nice. <laughs> yeah. He's, him and Marcus Crane are the only two dudes who have deterred me from doing anything. Uh, Marcus <laughs> Crane convinced me not to uh, not to do uh, pigeon strips, and Pondo convinced me not to do pencils. Right. So, they don't yeah. sound fun. <laughs> well, bro, no, uh, it, but I'm a dumbass, so. <laughs> well, you, you did just say you, you pulled out all those uh, cactus things out of your head, but 
now you've made the decision that you're not going to do it again. So you're not that stupid. Okay. You, <laughs> yeah, if you're going to be dumb, you got to be tough, you know? <laughs> um, all right, Brett, we, we get to the final segment of the show here. And it, it's called Five Second Frenzy. You've got five seconds to answer each question, even if you break the five seconds. I know you're a talker. It's okay. You won't get in trouble. Uh, the first question on Five Second Frenzy, Frenzy, bro, is who is your favorite wrestler? Uh, Masada Jukasai. Excellent. Uh, favorite opponent you've had over the years? Oh. Uh, this year alone, probably Dale Patrick's. Uh, Orin Bites, always fun. Uh, and probably Marcus Crane from back in the day. Like, I can't wait for Marcus to, to get all healed up and back in his groove and shit because – me and him will be the fuck out of each other. <laughs> Excellent to hear. Uh, if you could pick one match, what would be your favorite match that you've ever performed in? Probably me and Dale. From Umber Excellent. Team. Just, everything went such fluidly throughout that whole match. Like, there's not one thing I would change in the whole thing. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, getting away from wrestling now, do you have a favorite book? Uh, any Michael Crichton book, usually I'll read. Uh, I haven't read all of his works yet, but uh, one of the first books I ever read was Jurassic Park. Um, oh, right. outside of that, there's only one, uh, like piece of uh, literary, literary, you know, the word I'm trying to say, literary, Liter Liter literary. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I have to think about that. Then. Um, <laughs> Yeah, there's only one piece of work like that, and it's by Tennessee Williams called The Glass Mare and it's essentially about a man taking care of his mom and his daughter, and they're all just going through the hardships of life and dealing with their, uh, you know, identity and stuff like that, and it just really struck a chord to me. It's not even a book. It's a play, so it, you can only read it in the context of a play. All right, so, okay. Yeah, I, I'm Excellent. real big on Tennessee Williams, or uh, I can't remember his first name, but uh, it's something O'Flannery. It's how I came up with Seamus O'Flannery. Right. Uh, <laughs> I don't. I think it's Sean Patrick O'Flannery is the dude's right. name. Yeah. But uh, yeah, yeah, Tennessee Williams or Michael Crichton, I'm really big on. Excellent. Uh, favorite TV show. Right now, it is the Big Bang Theory. I have that shit on repeat. Uh, it used to be that 70s show. Um, trying to think of any other shows I've had on like repeat a bunch of times. Um, yeah, those, those are the only two for some reason. Like, I can just put that 70s show or Big Bang Theory on loop and just doesn't matter where it's at. I can just kind of sit down and watch and kind of get lost in it for a second. I, th I think it's just the character development's really good in both those shows. So I just gravitate towards them. Like, I, I don't get why people are like, oh, Seinfeld, it's the funniest show on it. Like, no. It's a bunch of fucking jerk-offs in New York who think they're better than everyone and don't learn shit throughout the season. Like, <laughs> the show's literally about nothing. Like at least in uh, always it's always sunny in Philadelphia. At least they get their comeuppings. Like it, it's like a Simpsons episode, just live action. You know? <laughs> no, I but know. I, I agree with uh, that right. '70s show. That '70s show I've seen probably you're, five times through. Every did episode. You hear that they're making a, that '90s show. No, I did not. <laughs> yeah, they're bringing back uh, the Foreman. They're bringing back. Oh, Ray Kitty. are you serious? Yeah, wow. Gonna, yeah, they're going to be taking care of uh, Eric and Donna's daughter over the summer. And that's the whole premise behind it. <laughs> so I'm looking wow. forward to it. I'm looking forward to it because it's based in 95. So, like, you're going to get the rap guy, the R&B guy. You're going to get the grunge dude, the metal guy. Like, you're going to get a cool <laughs> mix of uh, characters again. I can't wait for it. That sounds awesome. Wow. So you heard, you heard it here first, folks, because I heard it here first. Uh, he heard it here first, so it must be true for everyone else. Um, <laughs> On the internet, of course it's true. <laughs> uh, do you have a favorite film, bro? 
probably Endgame right now, only because it's it's newer. But a uh, movie I can sit down and it doesn't matter how many times it's on loop. You get the director commentary on. But Training Day is a badass movie. Agreed. Agreed. Um, like, like, like anytime I, I want to like get my point across, I'll just send the GIF of uh, Samuel L. Jackson looking at Ethan Hawke. And I know I'm in America and I'm a white dude, but I'm using the context of a movie. The way he turns and he's like, my nigga. Like, you know, <laughs> my, my dude, like in that moment, I was like, oh, okay, now I get why they say it that way. I, I get it. <laughs> You know, absolutely bro. anytime like i i always quote that movie because it, it's just really good from front to end and fucking just i can't get enough of denzel washington the dude's fucking awesome yeah i i think i've seen every film of his um favorite musical artist megadeth uh oh right now, nice bro havoc, right now it's havoc though uh have you have you heard of them i haven't heard of havoc no Check out their newest album called V or Five. Uh, it's fucking. They are literally leading the the way for thrash metal right now. Like they are the poster boys for thrash. So yeah, I definitely recommend oh, um, checking that out. Oh, I'll write that down. Yeah, I'm I'm, I'm big on my metal. Uh, oh, me too. We'll have to have a talk later. <laughs> Excellent, bro. Uh, moving away from the arts now. Favorite food? Sushi. Excellent like choice. That. Like, uh, have you heard of the Freebird Shop in Japan? Uh, I think someone's mentioned it on the show before. Yeah. Um. Well, uh, was it uh, is it Rika and Taka? Um, are are the owners of it, and I've become friends with them over Twitter and stuff. Anytime they post food, I'm always liking and retweeting it because I'm like, no, I want to eat that. So basically, anything Japan, I will. Like, I want to go to a live market and watch them chop up an animal and eat it, like, cook it right there on the spot. Like, I'm a morbid dude. I want to see all that weird <laughs> shit. <laughs> Got to get you over to Japan very soon, bro. Uh, favorite alcoholic beverage, if you could pick one? Uh, I don't drink anymore. I, I Ever since, my, uh, since I was little, I just never really... I'm more of a smoker, as you could tell, than I am a drinker. But if I had a choice, if it's like normal beer, it's usually Bud Light. Just easier going down. I know it's kind of like cat piss to you guys, but <laughs> it's, it's okay. <laughs> you know, uh, it's American cat piss, at least. Um, uh, but if it's whiskey, uh, I, I'll go with Jack Daniels. I can drink that like water. So. Like uh, me and uh, John Moxley's match, the full name of that match is actually a Kurt Henning drunken death match. <laughs> uh, and I told Ian, I was like, I don't drink, Ian. And he was like, Wait, what? You don't? I thought you drank. And I was like, No, I don't drink at all. <laughs> and he's like, Well, what will you drink? And I'm like, Jack Daniels. And I only took like one shot. And uh, during the match, you can hear the fans start to turn on me, so I have to take a shot. I'm like, God damn, I hate this. <laughs> have to be over <laughs> um favorite place to eat on the road oh usually i go for taco bell because it's super cheap uh i used to work for them for years back in the day so like I, i've kind of become addicted to their meat because they got very flavorful meat but um if it's a random spot that I don't get to eat too often, probably in and out. And that's because it's just cheap and it's always good quality food. It looks like fucking what's on the board. It doesn't look like right. a lot of shit in a box. Yeah. 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 I'm, 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 I'm pretty jealous always, of like uh, all the um, different establishments you guys have over there. We're actually getting a Taco Bell in our city uh, opening in the next few months. We, I've been waiting for this for like, 30 years so. <laughs> nice so yeah it's always uh, nice when you get the first things coming in you know yeah i'll have to um i'll send you a picture when i finally uh, get to have my first bit of taco bell um there you go 
Second last one, bro, here on Five Second Frenzy. Favorite female body part? There's a good looking girl around, you know, what would be the, the first thing that your eyes will gravitate gravitate towards? Mm. I'm gonna take a diplomatic way on this, only because like I, I'm very much that person that like I give a shit what's on the inside. Like yes. my last two girlfriends were were two hundred plus girls. And uh, and now I, I'm as long as you're closer to my size, you know, like I'm not the prettiest guy in the world. You know, I've got a fucking <laughs> slit across my fucking face now. So, you know, I, I'm definitely a dude who believes more of the inside than the out. But usually, like the most sexiest part I find on a woman is probably your hips. I don't know why. But like, not like the big hourglass hips. Like, I'm not really big on big butts or anything like that. But they yeah. got that slim kind of build and then, like, just those nice little hips that are un- attached to it. Like, yeah, I'd be like, mm, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> No, that's a good answer, bro. We, we, we've got many different answers on this show. Um, that's for sure. Uh, and the last one, bro, here on Five Second Frenzy, favorite curse word. Either fuck or shit, <laughs> and I I only say shit because shit is probably actually shit's probably my favorite word. Probably just because it's the most utilized curse word you can use. You can use it in any kind of context where fuck you can't. You know, yeah. like shit's getting crazy. Shit's wild. Shit's out of control. <laughs> you know, I am the shit. You know, like <laughs> yeah, you yeah, use it in different kind of terms and and still get the the desired effect you want. So probably shit. <laughs> shit happens. <laughs> awesome, bro. Awesome. Well, Neil Diamond Cutter, such a joy to have you on the show. And you know, I told you earlier, you're you you are a legend, and I'm sticking by that. Even if you disagree, that's too bad. Okay, you can't do anything about it because I'm on the other side of the world here in Perth, Western Australia. So I'm saying to you right now, you're a legend, and uh it, it means a lot to me to have had the opportunity to have you on the show. And just laugh because you've told so many great stories and you've made my face hurt from laughing. So I appreciate your time, sir. Uh, no worries, man. I always like doing interviews with people, especially when it's halfway across the world. Um, I want to say about three months ago, I did a, or somewhere between five, six months ago, I did an interview with a fucking dude in Italy and he's a <laughs> communist. So he just started talking about communism and shit. <laughs> like, yeah, I've done some weird things with people. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, bro. Well, I'm glad that you joined me here today. Really appreciate your time, bro. Uh, no, thanks for having me on, man. When I come down, I might actually have a beer with you. Sounds good, bro. I can't wait for that. And uh, thank you again. And thank you, everyone out there, for watching my exclusive interview here on the Insider's Edge podcast with the one and only Neil Diamond Cutter. And we will see you down the road. Thank you very much.